let me kindly take uh, this time and greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is Faith and Cut Church. Our vision is reaching the unreached uh, through and cut lives in Christ. And thank you very much once more for taking time to tune in, you know, and to join us online here on Facebook. And uh, it is such an honor and a privilege uh, to come to you and uh, or rather to praise and to worship our God with you this morning. And uh, may the Lord richly bless you as you take your pen, your notepad and your Bible so that we can go through the word of the Lord together. And today I will be teaching uh, the scriptures and the Holy Scriptures and the word of the Lord, the word of life, the word that endureth forever and uh, the weight, the eternal weight. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us heaven and earth shall pass away, but my weight shall remain. In the beginning was the weight and the weight was with God and the weight was God. And he was with God in the beginning. Within the way was life. The life was the light that shines to men. And darkness did not comprehend, did not understand, did not overcome the brightness of the light. And in verse 14 in John chapter 1, the Bible tells us, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the begotten. Son, hallelujah, of our heavenly Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. He is the Son of God. Hallelujah. And our Lord Jesus Christ is also God. He is the eternal weight of the Lord. That's why John the Apostle tells us that they handled this eternal weight. They, they, they beheld the glory of this eternal weight of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who was here on earth being fully man and fully God. And the Bible declares, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible declares, I will enter his, what, his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And can we today give our God the fruit of our lips and we tell him how great he is, how awesome he is, how wonderful he is. You know, I'm so inspired by the sons of Korah where the Bible tells us whilst they continually ask us about our God. Where is your God in the midst of this wilderness? Where is your God in the midst of this calamity that has befallen you? Where is your God in the midst of these destructive storms that you are faced with? But the sons of Korah, they penned down a psalm and then they said as a deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants after thee O oh Lord, my soul, fast for the Lord, my soul, fast for the presence of the Lord, my soul, fast for the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Whilst they mock us, whilst they continually ask us about the way abouts of our God, but as a deer pants for the water brook. So in other words, your question is not going to water down my unquenchable passion for God. Your question that the, your, your, your question that is sarcastic, by the way, your question that seeks to water down and to mock my walk with God, it's not going to talk me out, hallelujah, of passion. Pursuing his presence of pursuing my God. Hallelujah. Therefore, as a deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants after thee, O Lord. The Bible declares, blessed are those who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hallelujah. Our God is awesome and our God is perfect. 
in all his ways. And that's why, saints, in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of the challenges and the storms you are going through in your life, let me tell you something. Continue to seek, continue to thirst for the presence of the Almighty God. Don't run away from that presence. Don't allow the storms to extinguish the thirst and the desire for God's presence in your life. For in his presence, there is a liberty, there is joy, unspeakable, full of glory. That's what Peter the Apostle tells us, that this joy, it is full of glory glory can we pray today and together we give god praise together we give god the glory together we give god the honor in the midst hallelujah of the wilderness in the midst of the prison you are in last week we spoke about wall wrecking worship hallelujah Paul and Silas, they sang hymns and psalms in prison, in a dungeon. Hallelujah. Their ankles, they were fixed, or they, they, they were tied up in cold and rusty chains and their wrists as well and against the wall. But the Bible declares during the midnight hour, they sang hymns, they sang psalms, and they started to praise him, the sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah. And the Bible declares, and suddenly the foundations of the prison were shaken. The prison doors, they opened. The chains that fastened them, hallelujah, they were broken. They were destroyed through the power of praise. When praises go up, his glory comes down. Praise your way out of that prison. Praise your way out of that wilderness. Praise your way out of that depression. Praise your way out of that disappointment. Praise your way out of that rejection. Praise your way out. Hallelujah. And give God the glory. And I am, I am here to tell you in need that the foundation of that stronghold, the foundation of that lacquer, the foundation of that cancer, the foundation of that situation will be shaken suddenly and the doors will open. Open, hallelujah, and you will emerge victorious. Why? Because you serve a victorious king who conquered the power of death, the scheme of men, the power of hell, and emerged with the keys over the living and the dead. I am here to encourage you, child of the living God. Praise your uh, praise your God and praise your way out of that unemployment. Praise your way out. Hallelujah. Because our God is faithful and he will never leave us nor forsake us. I may not have employment, but I will praise him. I may not have a house, but I will praise him. I may not have a car, but I will praise him. I may not have A and B and C and D, but I will praise him. Why? Because my praise is not influenced by things, but my praise, it is anchored on who God is. I praise him for who he is in my life. Can we praise him? I mean this morning. Can we give him glory for who he is in our lives. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. You are the king of kings. You are the lord of lords. You are the great I am. You are the prince of peace. You are the lily of the valley. You are our shield. You are Angosam, the day star. You are the rose of Sharon. Bow it to my God. You are the lion of the tribe of Judah. My Father, we bless you this morning. We exalt you for who you are in our lives. Without you, we are nothing. Lord, we thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. My God. We appreciate you and we thank you for the precious gift of eternal life. For you came into this world to seek and save that which was lost. We thank you for this precious gift of eternal life that will usher us in the kingdom of God forever and ever. Where there will be no gnashing of teeth, where there will be no weeping, where there will be no sorrow. Bow it to us, we thank you. 
thank you and we bless you and we exalt you and we give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you praise God with me this morning? Praise him, worship him, glorify him, exalt him. Yes, God loves you and God cares about you. Hallelujah. And without wasting any time, can we go straight to the word of the Lord? And just before we go straight to the word, let me just read in the book of Philippians because today we are going to page our Bibles and Philippians chapter 4 verse 16. Uh, let me rather read from verse 15. The Bible says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. In verse 19, the Bible reads, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Now these are the words of Paul the Apostle. He writes this letter to the church geographically located in Greece and within Greece it was situated in the northern province of Greece in Macedonia and that is uh, Philippi and uh, the church of Philippians and uh, that Paul writes to this church and uh, to appreciate their gratitude I mean, so, so to express his gratitude towards their generosity in giving or towards their generous giving into the ministry. Now, Paul, he opens the letter by saying, he who began a good work in your lives, he will carry it unto completion. You know, and that is Paul, you know, writing and he also encourages them. He tells them that strive together for the gospel of Jesus Christ, being one at, I mean, at, at, at heart, in faith, you know, and in your minds, in your heart, and in faith, striving together for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He speaks about unity so that when I arrive and I see your state of affairs, indeed, you will be walking worthy before the Lord our our God, he goes to chapter 2, he speaks about the humanity of Christ, the importance of being considerate, the importance of esteeming other people's interests, he speaks about the attitude, the mind that was in Christ, and he goes on to speak about Jesus, who never took it as a robbery to be equal with God, but humbled himself up to the point of death, the death on the cross, yet he appeared in a likeness of a man. He took a form, as I said, as I've said, of a born servant. But God highly exalted him and given him the name that is above all other names. That at the mention of his name, every tongue shall confess and every knee shall bow and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now in chapter 3, he comes in again, he tells them that he's a Benjamite, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, you know, and he speaks about his profile, his qualification, you know, and his zeal for the righteousness of the law. And then he comes to a point where he says, but he counts all that as a 
futile as compared to the excellence of knowing Christ. Hallelujah. And then he comes to verse 10, chapter 3. There's all oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That I may be conformed, that I may conform unto his death. Now he comes to chapter 4 in verse 13. He says, now, I mean, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Yes, in verse 8, he says, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is praiseworthy, meditate on such things. But now he closes it, you know, by saying, believers, and uh, you know, at the beginning of the gospel, because the first church to be planted in Greece, it was in Philippi. Now, then specifical, now Paul is saying, thank you very much. Why? Because at the beginning of the gospel, you know that no other church shared with me concerning giving and uh, receiving I mean, and receiving, but you only church in Philippi. So in other words, you were there to support the ministry. You were there to ensure that the ministry is functioning, not just functioning, but you, you ensure that I was able to focus to the core of the church, to the core of my apostolic ministry, which was uh, reaching every city within uh, the nations of the world with through preaching the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. And indeed, this is exactly what the church was doing because why? God has given us the great commission so that we are able to reach the families of the earth through the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now Paul is expressing his gratitude. He comes to a point now where he says, it's not that I was, because I know you sent aid, you sent aid, you sent I mean this offering and, and it, indeed it's not that I sought or I was seeking a gift from you but I sought for a fruit that will abound in your account. So in other words, what Paul is simply saying here, he's saying, I will receive the offering through the hands of your representative by the name of Epaphroditus. Yes, it was a sweet-smelling aroma. It was a sacrifice, well-pleasing to God because it was coming from a pure, it was coming from a willing, full, and a cheer full heart and I received that offering and it's not that I was seeking a gift from you but I sought for a fruit that will abound into your heart, into your account. So in other words, when we sow, it is self-enriching. When we sow, it, 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 it nourishes us. It blesses us. Why? Because the Bible declares, blessed is the hand that gives more than the hand that receives. And the Bible declares, a generous eye shall be blessed. Why? Because he gives to the needy. He gives to the poor. A generous eye sees the need and meets the need. So in other words, as long as the Lord is blessing me and there's a need in the house of the Lord, I will sow. There's a need to my fellow sister, my fellow brother, my fellow neighbor. Oh, at that orphanage, I will give. Why? Because he has blessed me to be a blessing. Now Paul, he is saying, when you sow, you are not losing. When you give, you are not depriving yourself of blessings. But the opposite takes place. When you sow, the Bible tells us that our God, what does he do? He puts something, hallelujah, he blesses our account. Why? Because every blessing that manifests in the physical, it starts in the spirit. It. Hallelujah. Now Paul he gives us the picture here that we have each and every human being has an account. Hallelujah. And what the Lord will do and Paul he is saying here I sought for a fruit that will abound in your, in your account. A blessing that will
will abound in your account. Let me tell you something, child of the living God. The Bible, it tells us here. Then Paul, he closes by saying, And my God shall supply all your needs. You were able to meet the need in the house of the Lord. You were able to put first things first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Now Paul, he is saying here, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. My God who saved me on the way to Damascus. My God who preserved me when I was stoned and they thought I was dead, yet they left me half dead. Hallelujah. That God, when the ship wrecked, I'm telling you, even though the wrecking, the, the, the wrecking of the ship, it had not yet taken place here as Paul is writing, but I'm here to tell you that Paul is saying, my God who saved me from the wreck, from the ship that wrecked, my God shall supply, hallelujah, he shall supply your need according to his riches in Christ. Now, which Church is Paul speaking about here. It is clear that now this church of Philippi, it was able to model the, 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 the importance of sowing in the kingdom of God. And all other churches, they came along because now when Paul writes to the church in Corinth, which was also in the south of Greece, he starts by saying the Macedonian churches, now, he's no longer saying a church, churches, they gave out of the overflow of love. And they gave willingly, cheerfully, more than their ability, even though they were in a stricken and impoverished area. So I want to encourage you, child of the living God, to understand that it is scriptural to sow in the house of the Lord. It is God's will that we must be able to support his work, and we should be doing that out of a willing full heart, out of a cheerful heart, out of a sacred Artificial heart out of love that overflows within us, not by compulsion, not under pressure. And let us pray as we sow in the house of the Lord so that we may be able to run with the vision of reaching the unreached, of reaching the families of the earth through Elkan lives in Christ, through the message of the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank and we bless you and we give you the glory and we give you the honor for we know that as we give, oh God, bow to us, you are looking at our account. How can you bless and increase and supply and multiply the seed we have sown, oh God? We bless you, Lord, and we thank you and we give you glory and we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray, amen and amen. Man, hallelujah. Now, without wasting any time, can we go straight to our message for today? And uh, I'm not going to keep you. I'll go straight to the word of the Lord. The book of Joshua chapter 6. This is, I think, our third or fourth week in the same chapter of Joshua. Chapter 6, the Bible reads in Joshua chapter 6, let me read from verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city every man straight before him and they took the city and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city both men and women young and old ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword but joshua had said to the two men who had spy out the country go into the harlot's house from there 
bring out the woman and all that she has as you saw to her. And the young men who had, who, who, who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she heard. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers from Joshua sent to spy out the land. Father, we thank you once more for the reading of your word. Open up Bosham, the eyes of our understanding through the enlightenment of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I've just read in the book of Joshua chapter 6 from verse 20 up to verse 25. Now last week I spoke about wall wrecking worship. And last of last week I spoke about wall demolishing faith. And today I want to speak about us being chosen to be the fragrance of Christ. Chosen to be the fragrance of Christ. Chosen and called, redeemed, anointed to be the fragrance of Christ. Chosen for a reason. Chosen for a purpose. Chosen for God's destiny. Chosen for God's divine will. Hallelujah. And that is exactly what God has done in our lives. He did not redeem us and for the sake just of redeeming us. If he just, he came just to redeem us, he could have redeemed us and went back with us into heaven. That's why he prayed and said, Father, I pray that you don't take them out, but you keep them within. Why you must keep them within? Why you must preserve them within? I believe that you have a purpose. You have a destiny. You have your divine will. You have a seed. Hallelujah. That you have planted in their hearts. Even though when they were born, it was there within them, lying dormant. But I am here to tell you that our Lord Jesus said, Lord, don't take them up. Keep, don't take them out. Keep them. And that's why he knew, he knew. He even said, I send you as sheep among wolves, but be of good cheer. Hallelujah. Why you must be of good cheer? It is because I have overcome. I, have a, I, 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 I am an overcomer. And that's why you must be of good cheer. They stoned me, they will stone you. They hated me, they will hate you. The world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, but be of good cheer. I was able to triumph over the systems and the patterns of this world. I was able to triumph over the trickery and the craftiness and the temptations of the devil. Hallelujah, and therefore be of good cheer. I am with you. That's why the Bible tells us that greater is he that is in us more than the enemy, more than the devil that is in the world. Hallelujah more than he that is in the world, the spirit of antichrist, the spirit that seeks to exalt itself above the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I am here to tell you, child of the living God, that you are royalty. I am here to tell you that you are the son and the daughter of the most high God. I am here to tell you that you were chosen for a purpose. You were chosen to be the friend of Christ. Now the Bible tells us in the book of Joshua chapter 6 that yes, they surrounded the walls of Jericho six for six days, once a day. 
And on the seventh day, they surrounded the walls of Jericho seven times. And the Bible it tells us that Joshua had instructed the people not to, no, not to utter a word to remain silent. Even though maybe the soldiers of Jericho were provoking them. But Joshua said, you shall remain silent. You shall say nothing lest you respond to their provocation. And you talk yourself out of the breakthrough. Out of the blessing, out of your work, out of your destiny. And the Bible tells us that when you hear the priests blowing the trumpets, seven priests who bore the seven trumpets of ram's horns, when you hear the sound of the, tri of the trumpets, then you shall shout. You shall shout with the voice of triumph. You shall shout with the voice of victory. You shall shout with the voice, hallelujah, that of, of faith. And the Bible, it tells us, indeed, they blew the trumpet the priests, they blew their trumpets and the people, they shouted by faith. They started to shout for joy, shout by faith, shout of triumph, shout of victory. Before the walls fell, hallelujah, that was the shout of faith. We shout the voice of triumph. We shout with the voice of victory. We shout by faith before mountains move, before doors are opened, before walls of limitation and impossibility and failure and fear of the unknown. Hallelujah. Tumble and fall down. We praise him because we know why we praise him before the walls fall down. We know that he's capable. We don't just know that he's capable. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. And they shouted with the voice of child. And the walls, they fell flat. Mm. The walls, they fell flat. And they went up. Have a picture of the Bible telling us that the walls, they fell flat. Flat. So in other words, they marched within the city and they did not struggle to march within the city because God made it a point that these obstacles that were locking them out of their promise, these hindrances that were locking them out of their blessing, the Lord made it a point as I humble and humiliate the gigantic strength and power of the walls of of the Canaanites, that these walls, they will fall flat before the Ark of the Covenant. They will fall flat before the presence of the Almighty God so that my people will walk on these waters, sorry, on these walls and make their way within the city without a struggle. And that's what the Bible tells us, that they fell flat. And they went up, hallelujah, and within the city, without a struggle, without using their, I mean, they're trying to come up with devising a plan how to access the city, and they went right within the city. And I like it. Because when you look to the original text, again we see Jericho that it also means his moon. His moon. So which means we know that the Canaanites, they worshipped gods and idols. Yes, they would make human sacrifices. They, would, they believed in, div in divination, in fortune telling, in mediums, and spiritists, and soothsayers. Witchcraft was a web of witchcraft was operating within the land of Canaan. And that's why God prepared them in the book of Deuteronomy, which means the repetition of God's law. The Lord made a point that when you enter in Canaan, don't act, don't fashion your lifestyle, don't fashion your thought process, don't imitate the Canaanites. And uh, witchcraft was operating. It was rife. Where? In Canaan. 
It was taking place there. And the Bible tells me that our God was able to humble. Our God was able to destroy and break the stronghold of witchcraft. The stronghold of divination. The stronghold, hallelujah, of immorality in Canaan. Why am I saying so? Because the city, it was conquered by the Lord. The Lord led them to victory. The Lord led them in defeating the systems of darkness in defeating the systems of witchcraft in defeating the systems of darkness and the Bible tells me that they banned the city into ashes after taking out Rahab and her father and mother and everyone that belonged to her father's household and they were spared they were safe the only thing that they took, the silver, the bronze, every treasure, every precious thing, they took it into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, Joshua, when he pens and writes about the city of Jericho, now we see that Jericho, he did not only speak about his moon, and you know that they would worship the moon god. They would worship the fertile god. Because they thought that the reason why the land was well watered. It was because there was a fertile god. But again Jericho. I mean again Joshua. He gives us another perspective about the meaning of Jericho. And Jericho means aroma. Jericho means a place of fragrance. Jericho speaks about a fragrant. Hallelujah. And when you look at the meaning and the definition of the name Jericho, even Joshua, as he writes down, he writes down, and when he speaks about it after conquering the city, he speaks about the city as an aroma, as a fragrance. As a fragrant. Yes, even when you go to the book of Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, it tells us that when Moses told them about Jericho, he specifically mentions that the city where there are palm trees. Why? Because palm trees were flourishing in Jericho. Remember, it was not geographically, it was geographically located closer to the river Jordan and palm trees, the city of roses. Hallelujah. And that is Jericho. And today, I want us to understand, children of the Most High God, that when the walls fell down, then they had access into the land. They had access into the aroma. They had access into the fragrance. Hallelujah. The city of Jericho. The city of Jericho. And remember, you must not misinterpret the words of Joshua. Joshua spoke about the walls not being rebuilt. We will talk about that when I start that our teaching in about, I mean, about, uh, about Gilgal, the rolling away, the cutting of the four skins. But the point I'm trying to say, you must know that Jericho, at some point, it was a city that was inhabited again. Even during the life of Jesus, when he healed Bartimaeus on his way out of Jericho, when he healed there, another man that was blind on his way in the city of Jericho. But I am not there. The point I want to say to you, child of the living God, is that the walls, they fell down. They fell down. When Jericho was defeated, when Jericho was conquered, and then, and then they went in the city, the city of palm trees, the city of roses, fragrance. Now, spiritually, what is it that we can learn? Because they took the city physically. They conquered the city physically. They bent down the city. It was literally. But what is a spiritual significance? What is it that we can learn from chapter 6 
Because the walls, they don't only speak about an obstacle. The walls, they don't only speak about a hindrance. The walls, they don't only speak about limitation and impossibility and failure. The walls, they don't only speak about opposition. And the walls, they also speak about sin and pride. Sin and pride. Sin and pride. And that's why it's so important to understand that the walls of Jericho had to fall down through the presence of the Lord. But we say presence of the Lord. We are not talking here about the atmosphere and God is not there. We are talking about God being present. We are talking about the Holy Spirit. We are talking about the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. He is God. Hallelujah. And through the presence of the Almighty God, the walls, they fell down. And when the walls of Jericho fell down, which means the walls of sin, the walls of pride, the walls of arrogance, the walls of independence, of not trying, of not wanting to depend on God, but to be independent. And I am going to live and, and lead my life based on my own understanding. I am going to lean on my own understanding. I am not going to lean on my God, I am not going to be guided by the word. I am going to be so all sufficient. In other words, self sufficiency. It means I don't need the word. I don't need grace. I don't need mercy. I don't need to depend on God. Why? Because I can do it on my own. I can make it on my own. My own power, my own strength, my own wisdom can carry me to what? To my destiny. I am here to tell the child of the living God that. That wall of independence, that wall of self-sufficiency, it fell down. Why it fell down? So that they can access the promise, so that they can access the city of roses. I am here to tell you, let me give you a picture where the, of what the Bible tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. The Bible, it reads, in the New King James Version, it reads, Now, thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph, in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 14. Now, thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph, in Christ. And through us, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place of his knowledge of his light in every place for we are to God the fragrance of Christ for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other the aroma of life leading to life and who is sufficient for these things now for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing now I want us I want us to read here I want us to read something that is important. We, 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 go to, we go to another version. Let's go to another version and see message version. What the Bible tells us there. And we go to, and, uh, and then the Bible says here, What about you? I left and came on to Macedonia province looking for Titus and a reassuring word on you. And I got it. Thank God. In the Messiah, in Christ, God leads, God leads us from place to place in one perpetual victory parade. Through us, he brings knowledge of Christ. Through us, 
He brings knowledge of Christ through us everywhere we go. People breathe. They breathe in. People breathe in the exquisite fragrance because of salvation and aroma redolent with life. But those on the way to destruction treat us more like the stench of a rotting corpse. This is a terrific responsibility. Is anyone competent to take it on? Now, that is message. I've just read from message. Now let me read New Living Translation. I said we are going to read today the Bible. The Bible, it tells us, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, now we are reading NLT. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently from those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. Hmm. And who is adequate for such a task as this? You see, we are not like many of, I mean, let me not go there. Now, the most important thing was that I've just read here. It's to see that the Bible tells us here that in Christ, God leads us in triumph. And through us, you must mark this, through us, through me and you, God diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge, of his light, of his knowledge, of his love, of his kindness, of his compassion, of his mercy, of his grace in every place. Through us, God spreads. Through us, God diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place, at school, in my family, in my community, at work, wherever, in every place. God diffuses through us the fragrance of his knowledge. And then in verse 15, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ. That's where our message is chosen to be the fragrance of Christ. Because to God, we are the what? The fragrance. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. Among those who are being saved and among those that are perishing. Message and NLT, they tell us. Because those that are perishing, when they come, in, uh, when they come into an environment with this smell, with this fragrance, what do they do? They treat it as a stench of a rotting corpse. They treat it as a stench of death and doom. Why? Because the power of the cross, it is a foolishness to those that are perishing. Why? Because they have chosen the deeds of darkness and they have rejected the light. But now Paul is saying the very same aroma, the very same sweet smelling aroma, the very same fragrance, it brings life, it brings salvation, it is a life-giving perfume, hallelujah, to those who are being saved. In other words, they are people who come into contact with this smell, with this fragrance, they they smell mm, the fragrance of Christ and what happens in there then they what, what do they do they put aside the deeds of darkness the stench of death
death, the stench of hopelessness, the stench of sin, the stench of limitation, the stench of failure, the stench of independence, and the stench of self-sufficiency and not depending on God. And they embrace the smell of the aroma because Christ is the fragrance. Christ is the aroma. Now let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and we read there in chapter 5 verse 2 the Bible says and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweeter smelling aroma. Hallelujah. For a sweeter smelling aroma. You go to the holy place. The holy place. Everything that is in the holy place. The unleavened bread was pointing to Jesus Christ. The, God, the, the golden lamp stands. They were pointing to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The incense that was being burned unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Not just the prayers of the saints Christ was lamenting wailing, crying hallelujah in prayer to our God that's what the Hebrews tells us why? because Jeremiah the wailing and the lamenting prophet, he was the shadow of our Lord Jesus Christ what am I trying to say here? because the incense that, that, that they would burn unto the Lord, it was a sweet smelling aroma, it was me up with spices and the oil and the olive oil and it will bring a sweet smell hallelujah into that holy place and I am here to tell you that Christ he sacrificed his life hallelujah as a sweet smelling aroma and Jesus Christ he is within us the hope of glory the king of kings the prince of of peace, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the greater I am, the rock of ages is within me and you, and he's also the fragrance. He is the aroma, hallelujah. He is the fragrance of life. He is the fragrance of healing. He is the fragrance of hope. He is the fragrance of grace. He is the fragrance of mercy. He is that aroma. Hallelujah. And the Bible, it tells us here that the walls of Jericho, they fell down. And when the walls fell down, then they were able to access the city of roses, the city of palm trees, fragrance. What do we learn spiritually, child of the living God, that the walls of sin must fall in our lives. But for the Bible tells us, whosoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And thou shalt know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And Jesus said, I am the truth and the life and the way. Hallelujah. Way to heaven. And the Bible declares, if Christ sets you free, and you will be free indeed. That is exactly what we received in Christ Jesus by placing our faith on our God through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The Bible tells me that Jesus he was made to manifest to destroy the works of the devil in our lives to destroy the walls of sin, to destroy the walls of pornography to destroy the walls of immorality, to destroy the walls of jealousy of lying, to destroy the walls, hallelujah, of the pleasures of this world that pull us away from pursuing holiness and righteousness by the grace and the mercy of our God. Hallelujah. We are talking here about Jesus Christ, our Savior, 
The Bible tells us he foreknew no sin, but he was made to be seen so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. What does that mean? It means we have received righteousness. We did not earn it. We did not work for it. This righteousness, it was imputed. To be imputed, it means we just received it by grace. That is the positional righteousness. Declared righteous because because you have the righteousness of God within you. Our Lord Jesus Christ, like Abraham, who believed God and it was accounted and credited to him as righteous. He did not work. He did not, I mean, I mean, and try to do it by his own power and strength to end righteousness. It was a freely given to him by grace. Hallelujah. And that's why it is so important for us to understand Stand, children of the Most High God, that the Bible tells us, be holy as I am holy in all your conduct and your conversations. Why? Because how can a young man keep his ways pure? By living according to the word of the Lord. I need to study this word. I need to meditate upon this word. I need to hide this word in my heart so that I don't sin against God. I must depend on God's grace in in order to live according to this word so that I remain pure, hallelujah, I remain pursuing holiness by the grace and the mercy of our God. We progress, hallelujah, in our walk with God. Why? Because God hates sin. And God knows that as long as the walls of Jericho, the wall of sin, the wall of immorality, the wall of pride is standing and we are confined within these walls, there is no way that the people will smell Christ, that the people will smell the aroma. Now to smell, it is the metaphor of people seeing the life of Christ in us seeing the conduct of Jesus Christ in us seeing the likeness of our master in us hallelujah why because the walls have fallen now let me tell you something Christians they were first called Christians in Antioch why they were called Christians in Antioch it is because people they could smell, they diffused, hallelujah, the knowledge of God, the fragrance of Christ. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ, not only to God. Do you know what perfects us in God's presence? Because you and I, we are not perfect. You and I, we are not perfect, but what perfects us in God's presence, it is Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God in us. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that gives us boldness to enter the presence of the Lord with boldness, to enter the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may obtain mercy and grace to help us in time of need. Hallelujah. And now we are being told here that to God, in other words, when we approach him, mm, God can smell the fragrance of Christ in us. God can smell the aroma because Christ is in us, the hope of glory. It's not the situation of Isaac smelling is so, but the voice is of Jacob. It's not the situation of God saying, but the voice, I know the voice, but the smell, is, it's of lying. The smell, it's of gossip. The smell, is, it is the smell of slander. The smell, it is the smell of pornography. The smell, it is the smell of sex before marriage. The smell, it is the smell of sin. There's a stench of sin. There's a stench 
of the pleasures of the world. Hallelujah. But the Bible declares unto God, we are the, we, we are the fragrance of Christ. So in other words, when God looks at us, when we enter his presence, he can smell the sweet smelling aroma, the sacrifice of praise, our Lord Jesus Christ, who makes us to be acceptable in his presence. We don't enter by our own wisdom. We don't enter by our own acts of righteousness, self-righteousness, and like filthy rags in the eyes of the Lord. We enter through the grace and the mercy and the righteousness of our God, which is Jesus Christ, carrying the blood of the Lamb that was slain on the cross for our redemption. And therefore, the Bible declares, to God, we are the fragrance of Christ. Hallelujah. So in other words, whenever you come before the Lord, have this understanding that I'm standing before him. And what makes me to stand with boldness, it is the aroma within me. What makes me to stand with assurance and confidence, it is the righteousness of God, the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Bible, it says, not only to God, but to those who are being saved. There are people who are being saved. There are people that must be saved. So there are people who, who, are, who are going to be saved, rather, by observing our conduct. By observing our lifestyle. And now, Paul is saying, you are that fragrance. To those people, even to those who are perishing, you are that fragrance of Christ. To according to them, you may be a smell of death or a rotting corpse, but let me tell you something: you are the fragrance of Christ. The Bible tells us that you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You are like a city that is built on a hill that cannot be hidden. At night it gives light. At night it can be seen. Why? Because it is built on a hill. The responsibility of the salt it is to preserve. In the olden days there were no refrigerators and salt will be used to preserve. Hallelujah! Food. And I'm here to tell you that salt is is also there to add flavor and the light it brings light hallelujah so that we don't stumble and now you are the salt of the earth you are the light of the world yes you are the in you, in other words when you are the salt you are the light you are influencers you are influencers you are an influencer in other words why because when you put a salt into that meat, it does not become neutral. When it arrives, it arrives with influence. It arrives with flavor. It arrives to preserve. It arrives to change the color of that meat, to change the color of that food. Why? Because the salt, it has influence. When you switch on the light, then the light, what it does, it brings life, it brings light in the dark. Why? It means the light, when it arrives, it arrives with influence. When it arrives, it arrives with dominion and authority. And darkness bows down and it flees. So in other words, you are an influencer. On the Instagram, be the Instagram influencer. Be that Facebook influencer. Be that social media influencer. As what? Not just influencer, leading people. Because even if you lead people astray, you are influencing them. But today, learn that I am an influencer. I am the salt of the earth. I am the light of the world. And therefore, within me, I have the light of the world. Jesus Christ. And wherever I go, wherever I am, I must exhibit. I must display the light of the world. I must influence people in a positive way. I must influence people in a right way. I must influence people in a way that will add value 
you in their lives. Not only that, I must also be able to influence people through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ so that they come to, the, to, 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 to acknowledge the sovereign authority of our Heavenly Father and accept the work of Calvary. Hallelujah. And be saved. Because you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Why? Because you have Christ, who is the light of the world. Within us, we influence. Not in a destructive way. Not in a way that will make people to abort their destinies and their visions. But you influence them in a godly way. In other words, your life is a fragrance. That's what Paul, the apostle in Philippians chapter 2, in verse 12, he says, Work out your salvation with the trembling and fear. And he goes on to say in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do according to his word, according to his good pleasure, do all things without complaining and disputing. Verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Other versions they say as stars, hallelujah, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation. A star in the firmament at night, it gives light in the midst of darkness. Now, therefore, now Paul is saying, be blameless, hallelujah, do all things without complaining and murmuring, so that you can be the light, hallelujah, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation, so that you can shine as lights in the world. So in other words, let this fragrance of Christ at work, at school, in my house, in my community, where Wherever I am, let me diffuse, let me spread the fragrance of Christ. Because Peter, the apostle, in 1 Peter, he tells us, he says, Be holy, and God said, Be holy as I am holy. But Peter, the apostle, he takes it further. He says here when he speaks, he says, he says in, verse, in, in, in chapter 1, verse 13, and he says, therefore, get up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, not rebuilding the walls of Jericho, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct. Now Peter, he adds something here. He says, in all your conduct. Other verses, they say, in all your conduct and conversations. And conversations. So in other words, even when you gossip, even when you slander, that conversation, it does not diffuse the fragrance of Christ. Be holy as I'm holy in all your conduct. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible tells us. Here. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. This is this other word of the Lord, even in the book of Leviticus. So in other words, the Paul, the apostle, he even takes it further in the book of Thessalonica. He says, God did not call you into impurity, in unholiness. God called you into holiness. Now, that's the responsibility that we have as the children of God. That wherever we go, wherever I am, I diffuse the, his knowledge. I diffuse his love. I diffuse his mercy, his grace, his kindness. Because Jesus, he was the image of the invisible God. That Jesus was able to diffuse the knowledge of his God. He was able to diffuse hallelujah the image of his God. It was visible in Jesus. Hallelujah. Yet it was an invisible image of his father. 
What am I trying to say? Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. That's what the Bible declares. That all things work all together for good. To those that love God, he does not end the years. He predestined them. He justified them. He called them so that they can conform into the likeness of his son. And that is exactly the point, saints, I wanted to drive home for us today to learn that in our walk with God, we have the responsibility. You have been chosen. I have been chosen. You have been called by God, redeemed and anointed to diffuse his fragrance. Christ, the sweet-smelling aroma that let men smell Christ in us. Let men smell the aroma that is within us. So in other words, they must see the life of Jesus, the life of of Christ in us and we can do it Barcelona, through the grace and the mercy of our God through the work of the Spirit in our lives as we ensure that we live our lives within the parameters of the truth of God's word. Yes, we are all under grace. He is full of grace and truth. <laughs> Where there's no truth, this grace, it operates with truth. This grace, it is inseparable from the truth. This grace, it operates within the parameters of God's truth. Because Jesus, he is truth. That's why Paul, when he speaks, he says, where sin abounds, also grace abounds. Much more than sin must we continue with sin then, so that grace may abound. Absolutely not. How can we who died in sin live in it any longer. Why? Because all the things have passed away. I am a new creation. I am a brand new person. Why? Because I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ, the hope of glory, lives within me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live it by faith. Why? Because I received this righteousness by faith. I live it by faith. I received this justification by faith, for the just shall live by faith. Abraham was justified by faith. Rahab was justified by faith. We have been justified by faith and mercy and grace. And therefore, the life that I live in this body, I live it by faith in the Son of God who gave his life for me as a ransom. That's why now Paul, when he opens here in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He says God always leads us in triumph in Christ. Hallelujah. We triumph over sin. We triumph over temptation. We triumph over the pleasures of this world. We triumph over the addiction to pornography. We triumph. Why? Because God leads us in triumph. And therefore, there's absolutely no way. That's why when Paul speaks, he says in Galatians chapter 2, he says, if I rebuild what I destroyed, I become a transgressor. In context, Paul was simply saying, if you go back to Judaism, if you go back to rituals, if you go back to acts of righteousness, trying to make it on your own, but observing the law, and you forsake and reject the grace that you have received, then you will become transgressors. And again, what we, can, what we also learn from what Paul is saying there is that when we go back and rebuild the old life and rebuild the walls of Jericho. What we are simply doing, we become transgressors. Why? Because the walls of sin, the walls of unrighteousness, when they are standing in our lives, what are they going to do? They are going to overshadow, they are going to ensure that this perfume, this image of God that is within us, that must be visible through our talk, through our speech, through our walk, through our lifestyle, it's not going to be seen by man. Hallelujah. As I'm closing today, I want to encourage you, child of the living God, to understand that you have been chosen to be the fragrance of Christ. Before you, 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 you make that decision before you take off 
that anger and then you go to sexual intercourse with someone you are not married to yet you call yourself a child of God think for a moment and understand that no, no I was bought at a high price this is the temple of the Holy Spirit there's absolutely no way that I can indulge and sin with the temple of the Holy Spirit I was redeemed at a high price think for a moment that within me I have the hope of glory within me I have the aroma the sweet smelling aroma and that's why you know even in football in football a coach would want shy away from saying I don't need I don't want a stinking character because sometimes a player can be well talented but with a stinking character and we know people who are well talented as athletes but they did not have character and maybe you know you, you have heard about this I mean I mean about this phrase a stinking character in other words one can be beautiful one can be well talented well educated but be chased away i mean from the workplace and people run away from relating with you why because of the character that smells hallelujah but christ what he does he transforms us so that through our character it smells life that is a metaphor that is a metaphor of people seeing the life of christ in us that indeed this is a man of truth this is a man of integrity even when people are speaking and talking lies about you but because you are concerned about this smell of christ you don't answer inappropriately you don't answer even respond silence doesn't mean consent and subscribing to lies but sometimes you take a higher moral ground and let me not go to the 11. Why? Because I have the responsibility to be the fragrance of Christ to those who are being saved. To run with the vision, to run with the mission, to run with the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Chosen to be the fragrance of Christ. Tomorrow, let, uh, today and tomorrow, daily, let us be the fragrance of Christ. Whatever we think, whatever we do, let it be a sweet-smelling aroma to our neighbors, to our colleagues, to our friends, to our siblings, and to the world we live in, so that people can come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you, and thank you for taking time to listen to this message. Today you are here, joining us, and you'd like to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. He was bruised. He was wounded, he was pierced on the side so that your sins may be forgiven, so that you can become a child of the living God. You only believe with your heart that God raised Christ from the dead who was hung on a tree and became a cast offering who took the sins of the world upon himself. And he said, it is finished. In other words, the price has been paid in full. For their redemption. I've shed my blood. Yes, he shed his blood just for you and me so that we can receive the precious gift of eternal life. Leave the other messages. Come to church. You will be blessed. Come to church. You will receive a car. Come to church. You will have a house. Come to church. I and mean, this will multiply. This will double. This The first blessing and the greatest blessing you can receive from God. It is the precious gift of eternal life. To have a relationship with God. To have the assurance that you will make it into the kingdom of God. Not by your own strength, but through the life of Christ who died on the cross. You don't need to overcome that addiction on your own. Yes, it was Jesus overcame it. Jesus defeated it on the cross on your behalf so that you can walk in victory through Jesus. If you accept Christ, please pray after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for the precious gift of eternal life. I am a child of God. I am no longer a sinner. Amen. If you've just prayed that prayer, you are the child of God. Your sins have been forgiven. Yes, you are the child of the living God. Why? Because righteousness has just been imputed in your life. 
Because you have accepted Christ, who is within you, who is the righteousness of God within you. And you have the precious gift of eternal life. Please write to us, inbox us, so that we can walk this journey with you. Saints, may the Lord richly bless you. God is faithful. God is good. Rise up. You have been chosen to diffuse his fragrance, his aroma, his love, his kindness, his grace, his righteousness. God has chosen us and he knows we cannot do it on our own, but we can do it through our God. Hallelujah. May the Lord richly bless you. See you on our venue. We had load shedding in Madrid, but God is faithful because of the technology. And we thank the Lord that we were able to come to you live. I mean, this afternoon. But please join us at Accolades next week in person. And for the whole month of November, we will be coming in person until we close this year. God richly bless you. Remember, you have been chosen to diffuse, to spread the fragrance of Christ. Bless you.